शर्म बदतमीजी I'm Sangeeta Pillai and this is the Masala podcast where we talk about all those things that we're not supposed to talk about as South Asian women sex sexuality periods menopause mental health nipple hair shame and many more taboos and so you know you have to fight these minor battles because because once you do someone else will find it easier it's time we heard the voices of real south asian women not just those we see in bollywood or in mainstream western media it's time we had a real voice a loud and proud and strong voice I've never heard anyone say how can he have the audacity to do that. <laughs> doesn't sound right. It doesn't But sound right. How can she have the audacity to do that? <laughs> I've invited some incredible women to sit at my kitchen table, drink chai and put the world to rights. In this episode, I'm talking to the amazing Preeti Taneja. Preeti was born and grew up in the UK. Her novel We That Are Young by Gally Bega Press. won the 2018 Desmond Elliott Prize for the best debut of the year. It's been described as a masterpiece and an instant classic by critics in India, America and the UK. It's won so many awards, been translated into seven languages and will soon be a major international TV series. So, um why don't we start off? Tell me a bit about you and your background, where you grew up, what made you start writing. I don't really remember when I wanted to be a writer. I think it's just always been part of who I am. growing up i had a lot of books and big, and you know anyone who <laughs> grew up in this country in a in a in a second generation household will know that being good at school is something encouraged <laughs> very encouraged right <laughs> so reading was always a big part of that yeah and so it just you know it was a different time to now there was no internet etc etc and you know i loved books i was always reading and always making up stories and they were a real retreat for me from a world in which i just felt like i needed some control and when you read the characters in that book they become yours in a way that just is completely different from any other media um and it and it felt like an escape and a secret that something i was just for me so you know school is if you can do well at school then you can kind of get away with anything else that's true <laughs> no one questions the other stuff that you right, do right. so look my report card and now i'm just going to go and do this <laughs> but books that enable all sorts of um subversive ideas and thoughts and identities that you can experiment with and you know if you go to quite a, a, a you're in a in a normal in a household where there are certain ideas of how to behave remember whose daughters you are family honor is important um how the outside world perceives us indian daughters will all recognize these things that you know you have to be a good girl and and even though i i don't consider my parents to be in particular strict my mother in fact was incredibly free thinking radical woman she was absolutely trailblazing woman and quite quite kind of secure in her own identity um she really encouraged me to read as widely as i could she used to travel a lot for her own work um always brought me books by women from the places that she had been so That's collections wonderful. of irish women's short stories or panchatantra back from india mm. or those comic books amar chitra katha she used to bring them back in a suitcase or tales of indian women heroines that she could find in bookstores and stuff she really wanted us to have this very particular kind of grasp of indian mythology that was feminist um and celebrated female power that's so unusual she was very really unusual. unusual she was a very unusual at woman. that time and of that you know generation that's fantastic so talk to me about your culture which bits of british asian culture do you connect with if any I really celebrate having many strands to my identity and I hate the idea that I have to pick a side. I just feel like that is so damaging for us mm-hmm. as women in a new generation. Like when I look at women who are younger than me who are doing really exciting things like Burnt Roti magazine and all of these different things that are going on for South Asian women and South Asian talent and so on. 
I wish we had had those things when I was growing up, but we didn't have them because we couldn't organize in the same way. So when I'm thinking back, you know, to being a kid, I remember all of the things that made us, that we inherit from our parents. You know, I, I cooked with my mum every day. We had Indian food for dinner every day. I could make a perfectly round chapati when I wanted to. <laughs> she wore her sari to work, her silver kameez to work. She ran her own business. And I could do that if I chose to. I don't need to prove these things to anyone. I, I keep them inside myself. They, they, they exist in my mind and my bilinguality. Yeah, they exist yeah. on the page when I write because I understand when I use Hindi in my book, for example, it's the same way as it came to me at home, the language that we were scolded in and loved in and and worked together in as a mother and two sisters was Hindi. You know, one of the formative things that I feel like I've always done in my life is try to insert the everydayness of this into public spaces because it is every day for all of us. It is, I yes. wore my bindi when I was in Cambridge as a young student every day and people who thought Madonna was cool <laughs> were like, she's wearing a bindi. And then they have to rethink why they think yeah. that because I'm actually Indian and I had packets of this stuff. Exactly. Like every shape and color you could possibly think of, you know. It's so much a part of my everydayness. That, that you don't even I think never about even those question parts. It. I know I don't think about it. Yeah. It's in my syntax. It's in my. It's absolutely in my self-expression. It's how I choose to put myself in the world as to a mixture of many, many things. And I feel really excited, moved, and encouraged to see younger generations of women really claiming that, and just being who they are with everything they have. You know, I remember being at school. I went to quite a strict Catholic school <laughs> it was only because it was the best school in the town. You know, it's like you have to do, you have to do well at school. So yeah. you go to the best school in the town and there was a school uniform. But by sixth form, you were allowed to wear navy blue and it had to be, you know, and white. So you could wear a white shirt and a blue skirt or a, it, that was the regulation. It had to be a skirt. And I wore, I had a silver kameez made in India. Of the same color. Cotton, cotton blue silver <laughs> kameez. <laughs> some silver kameez. Because I just suddenly thought, hang on a second, this is really important. And I want to be able to wear my silver kameez to school. And there was a little bit of pushback from I school. I wonder, yeah. yeah there was. What kind of reactions did you get from the teachers or the students? There was, well, students couldn't say anything because, you know, yeah. I was... They could have, though. This is Yeah, they could know. have, but that was who I was. So, yeah, and I remember the kind of initial slightly lame protest that actually it broke school rule regulations because it's trousers. Yes. But that's a question of language. Precisely. And a question of translation. Precisely. You know? Yeah. And I was just like, mate, this isn't trousers. Yeah. This is my silver mm. Yeah. And you might think when you look at me, dress yeah. and trousers. Yeah. But I think silver kameez. <laughs> and so, you know, you have to fight these minor battles because because once you do, someone else will find it easier. This is very true. And well, and the world changes in these tiny ways and, and nothing is more important than that today. Very true. Literally this day in history when we're looking at all the things all that are of happening. our uncertain futures in the hands of complete mad people Absolutely. who don't see us. Absolutely. Don't want to think of us as humans. Absolutely. When I was talking to Preeti, I started thinking about my own identity. I grew up in India. I moved to the UK about 15 years ago. What does that make me? I'm British. I'm Indian. I don't know where one begins and the other ends. When I moved to the UK, I felt like I had to let go of my Indianness to fit into my new British skin. I got rid of all the brightly colored clothes, the bangles, the bindis. The saris went right to the back of my wardrobe, never to be seen for another decade. The bindis were pushed away in favor of more neutral jewelry. I can happily wear a bindi with a sari, but I would never dare wear a bindi with a Western outfit because it feels too much, too Indian, too loud, too much proclaiming my Indianness for the world to see. But hang on a minute, 
I see people wearing bindis at festivals all the time. Bindis mark the spot between your eyebrows, known in Hindu spiritual circles as your third eye. This is the centre of your innate wisdom, your higher self. I bet most people going to Glastonbury aren't thinking of their higher selves when they wear bindis. But why do I feel so awkward wearing a bindi? This is my actual culture, my authentic heritage. Which brings me back to my sense of identity. Which parts of me are Indian and which parts of me are British? I don't know anymore and I don't think it matters. I've become a mixed up collection, a beautiful sum of all those parts of me. And I kind of like that. I feel my brain melt into a kind of molten fury <laughs> because I've, 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 I've had to kind of navigate this idea that somehow to be acceptable one has to fit. And as a brown woman in this country, you're in a very particular position where modesty is used as a tool from every side you are looking to grant me the right one day to choose to have modesty don't tell me that modesty is how I should be if I'm in my South Asian family or when I'm operating outside that in a more mainstream white world because I don't have time to be modest for that yeah. first I have to show that confidence and it isn't arrogance and it isn't you know hysteria or angry brown ranting or whatever it is it's not audacity I've never heard anyone say how can he have the audacity to do that <laughs> it doesn't sound right it doesn't but sound right how can she have the audacity to do that? that sounds completely different absolutely. And we all know that phrase absolutely you know, go in your life, go in your world quietly if you wish to, but do it because you feel absolutely confident that you don't have to choose between a double identity because there's a, it's not a double identity that you are schizophrenic with. It's a dual reality and it's forcing you to feel that way. And once you can put yourself in the middle of that and say, this is just who I am and I operate in both sides of my world in my own way, you can, you can do what you want. That's beautiful. <laughs> that is really beautiful. Are you a writer by any chance? Yes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so they say, but it's taken me a long time, you know, to even say to myself, I'm a writer, I still wonder. Yeah. 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 Oh, do you think it says something, as women we struggle with, do you think men think this? I wouldn't want to generalise. You'd have to ask the guys. Yeah, yeah. true, true. Yeah. True. But I suspect not. <laughs> That's going on as well. So with Soul Sutras, all the work that I do is around tackling taboos within the culture. So everything from sex, sexuality, menopause, periods, lots. Lot, we have a lot of taboos to work with. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk about some of the themes in your book um, around homosexuality and female sexuality. What made you include those things in the book? I don't like being told no. And I don't like when the state legislates over the, over the body and about, and state legislation over morality, sexual morality in particular, is kind of a disgusting social construct, um, which I think culturally, if we buy into that, then we're asking to um, be told how to legislate our morality and that brings a whole bag of stuff with it shame yes is shame the is heart a very powerful tool. shame is a social tool used by patriarchy to keep minorities gender minorities women in place and this is another thing that i will absolutely reject and fight for anyone's right to say no to because i've seen lives damaged by having to deny the fact that our bodies are natural and normal and beautiful and they belong in temple spaces, they're sacred. You know, I have a degree in theology, I've read all my texts, I can absolutely find examples 
where women do the most beautiful and subversive to, to mainstream society things, you know. What does this come down to? It comes down to a worship of a kind of ideal of womanhood, a purity that does not exist. Yes. Doesn't exist. This question of um, homosexuality, the reason that's in the book is because, you know, of these colonial era laws. So one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is to link the ways in which Victorian thinking influenced Indian thinking about nationhood construction and construction of society and identity right yeah. so this colonial era law that kind of influenced the ban against homosexuality is if you like is one of the reasons why i made this character jeep a homosexual in the book and he's closeted but also because of something to do with the, the play the book is based on shakespeare's king lear and the character of edgar which this character jeep is based on is a really complex person and he's a very he's very good at hiding and dissembling and trying to protect himself he's got a and I never was convinced it was just because he was running away from fear the fear of being you know in rena in the renaissance period if he had been discovered to have written against his father yes it was a life or death situation but i don't know there's something about his ability to trick people about his identity that really suggested to me someone who was used to keeping a secret so close to him about who he really is. And I have a dear friend who was gay and he died. And oh it wasn't because of his sexuality, because the community around him was very supportive of him. And he was nothing like G, except in two important ways. First of all, he was gay and secondly, he loved art. And so, you know, the, there's a love relationship at the core of, the, of Jeet's character. And it's probably the true, pure love relationship in the book, if I can reclaim that word for something good. Could we talk a bit more about something you mentioned earlier about purity and women and the suppression of female sexuality, which is not in the scriptures? It is not our culture. Do you have any idea why that happened, when that changed? Well, that really is a question about who owns the story. Yeah. All right. So if you have a Brahmin culture in which women are not allowed to be scholars, rewrite text, translate, do the work of dissemination, the cultural production, then you're giving over power to a group of people who always need someone else to make their, to, to maintain their own elitism. We're in a struggle as Asian, South Asian origin women, not just with mainstream culture but like you say in our own in our own culture houses I'm, absolutely in our own minds about our own bodies absolutely and i think some something i always talk about is if you grew up and you spend all your life ashamed of of your body it's a long journey from there to say you know my body gives me pleasure and i want an orgasm it's a really long journey and i think women who don't grow up in that culture find it very difficult to understand and i keep saying it it's a very long journey. Do we even allow, like, the idea of female pleasure to come into our regular discourse, our cultural mainstream? We don't. But then you have to ask again, like, who's telling the story and why are they so afraid? Because what? there's fear around female sexuality, I think. But who's afraid? I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. You're not afraid. <laughs> there are lots of people who are afraid, I think, and that's why suppressing I've never that. met a woman who's afraid of her own body, <laughs> like, her own sexual pleasure. Yeah. Not afraid. But if we're, if you're told right. it's dirty, sharam, sharam, sharam is shame. Sharam is a massive, massive thing. I and mean, you, you mentioned shame before. Shame around your body. If you tell the four-year-old girl, ye chi chi, sharam, sharam, then that's what you associate with your sexual parts. Mm -hmm. Then when that girl grows up, she's not going to go around saying, oh my God, my body's amazing and I want pleasure. No, of course not. Especially um, she doesn't see anything in white culture that says Indian women have, South Asian women have sexual beauty and sexual pleasure in their own terms. Absolutely. And anything in Indian culture that, that, that can be honest and open about that. And that has changed a lot in India. It's changing in India. It yeah, definitely is. I think is. it I've really seen. is. Yeah. And that all, you know, all different kinds of culture have pr yeah. production, yeah. have responsibility for that. Yes. Movies, books, yeah. and magazines don't just show brides mm. in bridal, you know, being yeah. married is about if being married is about 
let's say within cultural and social mores, if you're supposed to remain a virgin until you're married, as all advertising will suggest to you, then why do you look so shy on your wedding day? <laughs> because that's supposed to be the point. Yes, you know? yes. What's it yes, allowing? Yes. Someone said to me um, the other day that they were talking about this instance of this bride looking too excited, quote unquote, on her, on her wedding day. Surely she should be very excited. But there's this whole idea that the bride's demure and shy and doesn't raise pure, her eyes that somehow up. Somehow her own purity yes. is being given as a gift to her future husband, husband. and his family. Yeah, and that purity also determines the, her family's honor. Honor, because because in that kind of thinking, there's an objectification of women as a kind of property, yes. a mark, a badge of honor. Yes, exchanged between. The father, father to the husband. husband. And it's it's again what like a cow. Like a cow. Yeah. Your father owns you, then your husband owns you. And that's that's your life. And then your children, your sons own you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basic stuff. Laws of Manu. <laughs> Manu. Right. Exactly. Do you know anything about Manusmriti? Manusmriti. Yeah, yeah. I've read it in translation and I've read it um not the all, the whole thing, but certain parts of it just infiltrate everything we think about. So Hindu, I'm Hindu very life. curious, and I don't even know who to ask. Uh -huh. Go and read so Wendy Doniger's translation of the Mani Smriti. I will do that, yeah. and then I'll come back and ask you more questions. And read We That Are Young, because We That Are Young is a kind of, it's not realist novel, right? It's a kind of hyper-real, very epic, and, and, and skirts over a lot of mythology. So it's meant to be a kind of sort of vision of India, in a way, of the darker si sides of, and in fact, reality has way past the violence and the gender um, restrictions and some of the things that some people reading the book might think are overdone. Hey, no, <laughs> just no, <laughs> because reality has gone way ahead of, of, of and corruption and so on um, of what I've written True. about. But hopefully the book will stand as a, as a testimony to what was going to come. And there's a section in it where Jeep teaches the slum children, the busty boys, some of the Manu Smriti, um, because he's trying to he's trying to socially engineer those who are most vulnerable into a way of life which is to do with purity, that privileges men over women in terms of being in the world, where a woman basically goes from father to husband to widow to chat to mother to widow, and yeah. yes, there has been huge difference in movements. We're here having this conversation. Yeah, this which is amazing. In itself Yes. But those things still exist. And it's still Completely. on all of us to keep on showing them up. Completely. I'm starting to question what identity is all about. My two identities have merged together so seamlessly that I can't see where one begins and the other ends. I've always felt that when you leave your home country, you can never really return because your identity changes when you set up roots somewhere else and you can't go back to who you were. The India that I left behind doesn't even exist anymore. The Britain I moved to is changing and it's terrifying. I'm Sangeeta Pillai. Thank you for listening to the Masala Podcast. Masala Podcast is part of my platform Soul Sutras. What's that all about? Soul Sutras is a network for South Asian women, a safe space to tell our stories, a place to reclaim our bodies, to tackle taboos within our culture, to be exactly who we want to be. Get in touch and tell me your stories about your taboos. Check out my website, soulsutras.co.uk, or get in touch via email at soulsutras.co.uk. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Just look for Soul Sutras. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe and leave me a nice review. It really helps.